by the last day of filming, um, some people were definitely annoyed because we were <laughs> just just kept talking. And that last scene with the Orion at the arch, we're just like, you know, all of that was just like us bantering, me being like, I feel like Pike doesn't listen. Like, you know, we're time travelers, that's what we've been talking about. That was all just nonsense. Everyone, please uh, give a round of applause. Welcome to the Farpoint stage, Tawny Newson from Lower Decks and many other works. like chanting in a Hilton ballroom. We love it. <laughs> Thank you. I brought my sign out in case you guys were like, wait, who am I here to see? Now it makes sense. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so um, if, uh, if people have uh, any questions for uh, Tawny, there's a mic in the center aisle that you can come up. Uh, we will call on people as, oh, they, okay, as they come. Okay, okay, okay. In the Mariner oh. cosplay, too. First out the gate. What's up? <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. We all really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so before I ask, I'm correct in assuming you record the voices first and then they animate? Yes. Okay. Was there ever a time when you were voicing and you're having a vision in your head of what the scene would play out and then you see it when the episode airs and you're like, that ain't it. Or was there a time, or the opposite, was your time like, that is so much better than what I had envisioned? You know, that's interesting. I, n I don't really envision it because, but, but I will answer, you know what? This does happen to Mike, our showrunner, who will write a scene and it'll be really clear in his head and it's really clear in the action lines for him what he thinks is gonna happen. And then our artists, come back with something that's like totally different. And a lot of times he just goes, okay, yeah, let's do it like that. And then he'll have me come back in and re-record it. Um, this is not a spoiler, but a, a really distinct thing that happened for season five. I recorded a scene with a character where we were just like in like kind of a bickering fight, but not like an intense fight. So we we're just kind of like, oh, you never listened to me. Well, that's because you're always doing this. So I was kind of doing it in that tone. And then when they animated it, um, the two of us are clinging to the top of a palm tree. <laughs> and Mike was like, you got to redo this because you're clinging to the top of a palm tree. And I was like, it doesn't still play. It doesn't really work. You know, I'm like texting. Him. I'm like, you can't just use the audio. And he's like, come in and look at this madness. Right, 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 right. right and I came in and it's like the top of a swaying thing. And I'm going like, oh yeah, you never listen to me. Yeah, why don't you ever listen? It looked crazy. Right, so I was like, right. okay, you're right. I got to like redo this part. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I know one question that uh, has been on my mind. Um, I know that the entire uh, Jennifer arc um, essentially started with an ad lib. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if the arc started. I, I just gave that Andorian a name. I didn't know it was an Andorian. I was just improvising, like, running down a hall, pushing past people. And I just always think it's funny. This is, like, a improv crutch that I've always used. It, it's always funny to just, like, add in one weird specific. So it's one thing to just be like, oh, I'm running down a hall. Oh, get out of my way. Move. Hey, you, get out of here. It's way funnier to say, like, you, Gary, move, you know? Because it just, like, I don't know. It just It's funnier to have a specific. So I just said, move, Jennifer. And then what they animated was an Andorian, and I'm like, well, I wouldn't have given her a human-ass name if I'd known <laughs> it was an Andorian. But now I think Lower Decks now has a, a, a little t trend of having, like, human-named aliens, which I think is really funny. <laughs> um, I personally thought that uh, Jennifer just happened to be a traditional Andorian name and just a wild phonetic coincidence. Uh, oh, I like that. I like that headcanon, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I think we've got another question here. Oh, th Thank you. Uh, hello, Tony. Thank you for coming to uh, for our point and sharing this time with uh, us. Um, I was wondering, when you were first cast as Ma Aaron, or, mm -hmm. um, did you have any real input into how, how that voice for that character was developed? Or did they have a distinct way that they wanted you to do the voice? Um, the only 
distinct thing that Mike McMahon ever wants anyone to do is be the loudest and fastest you've ever talked in your life. <laughs> So no, there was no like, I think this character would sound like that. No, he was just like, louder, faster, shout it. We actually, in the booth now, we do, when Mike isn't there, we call it a McMahon. So we'll say like, okay, do it a few times. And then our producer, Brad, will go, okay, now give me a McMahon. And that's one where you just go, okay, blah, 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 and just like run all the words together. Because that's how Mike really talks. Like, Mike is a cartoon. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Hello. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, um, thank you. So, there have been a lot of previous uh, Star Trek cast members who've gone to direct and even uh, produce, but you're the first, I think, who's been in the writer's room. Yeah. Um, and to say nothing of the fact that someone, like a Second City alum, yeah. would have such an influence on Star Trek was at some point inconceivable. So, can you pull the curtain back a little bit and talk to us a little bit about how that approach uh, was made, like how you, you got into the writer's room, yeah. um, how the ask was made, and how it was determined that the, the Academy series is going to have you know, the humorous tone similar to the work you're doing in, um, in Lower Decks. This is several excellent questions. You're, you, you're like a professional. <laughs> yes. I love it. Um, yeah, I can give you the whole rundown kind of as quickly as as possible, but really it all comes back to one person, Alex Kurtzman. I, to be perfectly candid with you guys, I had a, a problem with a contract. I had a, just an issue, you know, sometimes like you do work and it, everyone at the franchise is so lovely and we all love each other and we're a family, but then there are these like studio lawyers that decide how much you should be paid for a thing or whether you should be paid for a thing. And it's an impersonal business where they don't really know us. And so I had a, a con contractual problem that I couldn't solve with my agents, with these lawyers going back and forth. And so uh, Alex Kurtzman called me and he said, I heard there's a problem. And I said, yeah, can you help? And long story short, he like helped in the biggest way possible. And then from that point on, and this was years ago, from that point on, we just had like a, a dialogue. Like he would text me pictures of his dog. We just had like a friendship, you know? So then when I did the Strange New Worlds crossover, he was not on set in Toronto, but he was watching all the dailies. And he, I think he texted me, was it after? I don't know if it was during when we were texting or, or when we were filming. He definitely like called Jonathan Frakes and said, tell Jack and Tawny more improv, please. Um, which was like the greenest of green lights to keep going bonkers. Um, but then I think after he'd watched a few days of the dailies, he called me or texted me and he said, okay, I can tell you're a writer because of the way you improvise. You're not just like, because some people are improvisers, but then they get in front of the page and it's like, you know, not the same thing. Um, but he was like, I've watched all of your dailies. I even asked for the stuff on the cutting room floor so that I could watch all of it. And he really had like kind of a full understanding of me as an artist at that point. So he said, I can tell you're a writer. Send me everything you've written. And I just finished two uh, features that I had just written just for specs to send out. And he read them both, and he approached me at Star Trek Day uh, in 2022. And he said, okay, I have all these ideas for you. We're gonna do this, I'm gonna produce this, we're gonna do this together, we're gonna develop a thing together, and you're gonna be in the Starfleet Academy writer's room if you want. And he just like, just brought me in in like the biggest way and has been my biggest champion and supporter. I just, I couldn't be more grateful. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Welcome, Tony. Hi. Hi. Um, one of the things I was so impressed by was when you injected the crossover with Strange New Worlds, because I didn't, you know, it never can be pulled off right, where, like, your characters can translate so well from animated to a live-action thing, but you just pull that yeah. off beautifully. Um, I just thought it was a missed opportunity that Noel and Eugene couldn't be there, because I, I think they probably could have done that with them, too. Yeah. Um, was that... On intentional that they based that they when they designed your characters that they were going to resemble you guys or was that um no it was accidental because the the artwork for the characters was done the initial artwork they, they changed them a bit the initial artwork for the characters was done before we were cast so when I went to audition even though it was all like coded you know not Star Trek it was called like the California space crew or whatever and I was like this is Star Trek um <laughs> 
<laughs> but they had like, uh, so I knew that the role was written for a, a woman of color because I walked into that wait, waiting room and it was every comedy woman of color in LA. It was like all my friends, you know, it was like all these people that you would recognize from TV. We were all like, hey girl, hey, hey, hey. So I was like, oh, this role is meant to be like a black woman or a Latina woman. And uh, yeah, so, but it's funny looking back at that original artwork, it is like just slightly different. Mm -hmm. So I think once they cast us, maybe they adjusted it a bit. Yeah, because that's great. Now, I'd yeah. love to see Noelle you know, green, but I don't know if she yeah. wants to go through the makeup process or what. But uh, yeah. You know, Noelle is the sweetest person alive, and she also has some of the best like personal boundaries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's been in this business a long time, coming from SNL. I think she really, she, she'd be down, but I don't, yeah, I think she would, <laughs> she would only do what she's comfortable with. That's one of my favorite things about her. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, do you have to um, make any? Uh, uh, I don't. I don't know. Lifestyle changes like diet and that kind of thing when you're doing voice work. You said lifestyle changes. I got scared. Oh no! no yeah, I, I know. I was like, "What do you? What do I, I have know. to do?" <laughs> uh, no, I don't want to go there. Um, no, just like, like leave your husband. I'm like, why? Why? <laughs> I'm talking things like changing your diet uh, and and that kind of thing. Um, I've just I've heard voice actors like there are certain foods. for voice acting. Yeah. Oh no, I don't work that hard. No. You don't work. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, no, no. I, no, truly. Like I know some people are very uh, dedicated to their craft in a way that I respect, but don't choose for myself um, because I exist as an entity outside of my career. So first and foremost, I have to live the way that makes me happiest. And, and, and part of that is like, you know, li living in a way that, that supports the career and allows me to do the best work, but I can't get into, I can't get into punishing my body and my psyche in order to make my voice sound different or look different. I just can't do it. I'm too old. It's too tired out here. We can't do it. So yeah. So no, I'm not that dedicated. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Hello again. Hello again. So first off, if your name is Beth and you are expecting your tiny human to join you, he is going to be at like the main resource info desk, trouble navigating the crowd. So okay, a lost okay. child for Beth. Beth, your child's <laughs> lights are on and they're at the. Uh... Um, second thing. Right there. Okay, Beth's got the lost child. No longer lost. Love it. Okay. Oh, what a happy story. <laughs> um, it was such a quick arc. I loved it. It's great. It's great. Um, as someone who's really open about being a Star Trek fan, kind of before you came into the franchise, did you have any like uh-oh or like really exciting moments of just like nerdy fandom while you're trying to be professional at the same table with all of these greats? Oh, I do all the time. I was just at the Saturn Awards and, you know, I've gotten to hang out with the, the Picard cast, the TNG crew, a, a number of times now. But you know what? I really hadn't connected much with... Um, uh, Spiner as much just because like I'd seen him at like Vegas and I saw him on the cruise and stuff We were just kind of ships in the night and we were both waiting for our like ubers after the Saturn Awards And it's pouring rain and everyone in LA freaks out because they've never seen rain before <laughs> And so <laughs> everyone's truly panicking everyone's like asking if we're okay, and I'm like it's rain I lived in Chicago for 15 years. This is nothing um, so Spiner and I are waiting for our cars and we're just like shooting the shit and talking about, you know, I don't know, just everything. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I'm, I'm talking to Data. Data and I are both, we can't get to our cars because there's a torrential downpour <laughs> outside. I never thought that'd be my life. <laughs> cool. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a c couple questions. Okay. Uh, okay. So first of all, you and Jack are really good at improv. Um, <laughs> So did the live action give you opportunities for that? Because I know voice acting doesn't give you a lot of opportunities for improv, and are there any coming up? Also, I know you mentioned Starfleet Academy earlier. Uh, for those of us who like can't afford the cruise, is there anything cool like coming up that you can tell us about Starfleet Academy? Oh, man. Okay, so I'll answer your first question first. So yeah, the crossover let me and Jack improvise a ton. I, I mentioned earlier that uh, you know we went into the crossover with Frakes' blessing, with the two writer, Bill Walkoff and Kat Lynn, with their blessing, the showrunner of um, 
Strange New Worlds, Henry Alonzo Myers. Everyone was like, we want you to make this your own. We want you to improvise. Now, I've been in this game a long time. A lot of people look you in the eye and say, we'd love for you to improvise. And then you get on set and they're like, can you actually say this and not that? And you're like... <laughs> So I always go in very like, hey, I know the script cold. I'll give you one as written, but I'm not a, uh, in all my live action work, I'm not a word perfect actor. I don't do word perfect sets because I'm a living, breathing organism. Like when you wrote this, you didn't know who was going to say it. Now that I'm here saying it, I know the best way that it's, I don't know the funniest way for the world, but I know the funniest way for it to come out of my mouth and body. So I always insist on that. But Jack and I still were like, we're gonna tread lightly because this is not our show. There's a whole cast here. There are um, egos to service, you know. And then after uh, Kurtzman and the rest of the producers saw the dailies, they were like, more, go more, 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 more. And then we were just like, you couldn't stop us. By the last day of filming, um, some people were definitely annoyed because we were <laughs> just, <laughs> just kept talking. In that last scene with the Orion at the Arch, we're just like, you know, all of that was just like us bantering, me being like, I feel like Pike doesn't listen, like, you know. <laughs> We're time travelers, that's what we've been talking about. That was all just nonsense. Um, and then what was your second question, Starfleet Academy? I can't say anything. Oh, because, okay. that's fine. Because as an actor, if you say some spoilery stuff, like they kind of slap your hand. As a writer, because it's an organism that's changing, like anything I tell you today could be different tomorrow, then I get in huge trouble. Because it's like, it, it just might not be true. So but it's happening, right? Oh, it's happening. Oh my God. Yeah. I just had to write my episode. My brain is on fire. It's happening. It better happen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. Kapla. Kapla. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, I really love Lower Decks. It's honestly my favorite of all modern Star Trek shows. It's yeah, and I actually got to tell NPR that. So when they oh, were wow. doing a show, yeah, they were doing a show about it about a year or two ago. So I got to send in an email and said how much I love the show, and it was quite gushing for a Klingon. Um, <laughs> were you dressed like this when you talked to NPR? Uh, I can't say. <laughs> because no, you don't I know? wasn't. Okay, <laughs> I was like, do you not remember? Did someone hit you over the head? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, what I really want to ask you is, um, when are you going to be back with new episodes of the Pod Directive? I really, it's one of my favorite podcasts. Thank really you. Enjoy. No, we love it too. You know what's messed up is because that's a CBS studio sponsored item, that fell under the strike uh, rules. So when Hollywood went on strike, a lot of people were still able to do podcasts but our podcast was specifically made by the people we were striking against. So as actors and writers, we couldn't do it. So it put this huge gap in our production timeline. But um, we're getting back to recording. We have episodes in the can that I'm kind of like, why didn't they just release those in the meantime? I think they need like updating. We have to like do little bumpers at the top and bottom. So we're doing that in March. So maybe you'll have it in April, if I had to guess. But yeah, sorry, it's because of the strike. Thanks for your question. Hello. Hello. Tony. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Lower Decks is absolutely amazing, as you can probably guess. I have a question. Is there anything particular for any of the main characters, storyline-wise or timeline-wise, that from where they started to where they've ended up that surprised you? Uh, for example, for me, I'm kind of surprised the turn it took where Ransom is now kind of her mentor. Yeah. Because they had such an adversarial relationship, especially in episode three, where they got, both get caught. That's where the show really hooked me. So it's enjoyable to see where they are right now. But was there anything like that that really uh, surprised you in a good, pleasant way? Or even um, a way where you're like, oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah, uh, weirdly, I was going to say Ransom. His whole journey has made him so likable, you know? <laughs> you uh, which, don't say. <laughs> which is great because uh, Jerry is so likable. I kind of think that a after a while, like, it's not that the characters took on the, the actors' personalities, but it's almost just like, so Jerry O'Connell in real life is a maniac, and he's the sweetest, most supportive person. Like, anytime I do like a red carpet or anything, he calls me the next day, he'll like have Rebecca on the phone next to him, and he'll be like, we just wanna tell you, you look beautiful, you look so good in that color, but they're like, like an auntie and uncle or something. <laughs> but he's also the man who is, I mean, I could name a million things he's done that are so unhinged that I'm like, how are you still alive? You're a crazy person. <laughs> um, so I wonder if some of that bled into the writing of Ransom of like, he's just not what you expect. He's actually like really capable and sweet and like a good commander. Um, 
Yeah, that I think that was the biggest surprise for me. I, I love how they've written him over the seasons. Thank you, thank you. Um, one final question, if I may. If you had a dream crossover, have a character brought into Lower Deck, so if we've had Sulu, we've had some truly amazing one. Is there a character that hasn't been brought into Lower Decks in some way, shape, or form yet that you would love to see? I mean, this is so obvious, but Ben Sisko. Yeah. I mean, that's... Thank you. That's the holy grail, you know? I knew you were going to say that. Uh, uh, yeah. If I said anything else, you'd be like, did someone kidnap her? Is she all right? Well, Deep Space Nine is my favorite show, period. Same. Yeah. Ever. And you told Rock. You wanted to be part of Cisco family. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, elaborate on that. Um. What? When? When did I say that? What did well, I we're say? Doing a podcast of the Seventh Rule. Oh, on the Seventh Rule. Yeah, I think I was like, I want the Ciscos to adopt me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I just was like, I just want to be part of this. I want to go back in time and be in that show to the point where, I mean, I think you guys have heard this. I, the press talked about it a lot when it happened in season three. But when we did the Lower Decks Deep Space Nine episode, originally Mariner wasn't on Deep Space Nine at all. She was on her B story, Candle Party Bullshit with Jennifer. And normally I don't mind when, you know, as, as the lead character, some, some actors really don't like when their character gets put in the B story and other characters carry the, the A story, like the main story. But I was like, no, it's fine. As long as it's a fun story, I don't care. But this is the one time I called Mike McMahon and was like, you, you cannot have my character not go to Deep Space Nine. That's not allowed. I was going to ask you. That's not permitted. I was going to ask you, was that real? Did you do that? I, oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I think he kept the texts from me. I think he screenshotted <laughs> them. Because I was like, what the? I used a lot of expletives. That's how we talk. I was like, what the F do you mean that you don't have Mariner going to? And he's like, Mariner used to serve there. She's over it. And I was like, well, me, Tawny Newsom, the woman who's going to beat you up, did not used to serve there. And I need to see my little girl talking to Kira and Armin Shimmerman and them. And he was just like, fine. So he added, it was already animated. He added the scene at the bar at the end so that Mariner could be on Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're a woman up to my own heart. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Uh, hello again, Tony. Hello. How you doing? Good. Um, let's have like six or seven more in uh, seasons of deep, uh, of uh, of uh, lower decks. Sure. Okay. But <laughs> what is your? Now I'm talking. It'll be eleven feet in, in uh, deep. Or, um, in you Star keep Trek. wanting to say Deep Space Nine, and I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it was on my mind because he was just <laughs> talking about it, or or Space Force. But what? is your favorite non-science fiction role. A role? Or, or mm. something that you did that you liked the best. I really liked, um, I did a show on Netflix that I almost said nobody watched, but the truth is just only black people watched, which is <laughs> fine, um, called True Story with Kevin Hart and Wesley Snipes. Um, it's still on Netflix, you can go watch it. It's really interesting. It was made by um, the showrunners, one showrunner from Sons of Anarchy and one from Narcos, and, and then Kevin's production company. And it is a half-hour drama that, that like mirrors Kevin Hart's life as if he's like this fictional stand-up comic, and then like a crime happens, and it's really dark and gritty. But because it's half-hour, and because Kevin himself is a comedian... I played like his comedy writer who's on tour with him. So it's this re weird combo. I've never done any drama before, but it, it was a weird combo of like me getting to play a comedian within a dramatic world, but bouncing off of, I, I mean, I just think Kevin is one of the greatest comedians and human beings out there working today. I think he's so incredible. He's so kind. He's such a great boss. Um, and then Wesley Snipes is Wesley Snipes, you know? So I, I loved doing that, and I was sad we only did one like season of it. It was like a limited series, but it's called True Story. Mm. I really liked it. Thanks. Cerrito Strong. Hey, Cerrito Strong. Thanks. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi, Tani. Hi. Uh, I'm a science educator. I'm really, really excited about Starfleet Academy. Yay. Uh, my question is, is there a mentee-mentor uh, relationship that you have that you really value, and how has that informed or um, impacted your approach in the writer's room? Um, I, this is going to sound like I'm kissing his ass, but I'm really not. I really did not ever have a mentor until Alex Kurtzman. He really has taken me as like, it's weird to be like 
you know, friends and, and be treated like such a peer, but also know there's so much I can learn from him. But then in the same way, he's very, like, not comedy-minded, so he really is, like, learning from me. And it's funny, as we write together, I can see... I can see weird little, like, comedy rules I've taught him. <laughs> I can see him, like, Im implementing them in the writing. And he really has taught me so much about structure, about also just about leading a company, like, the, the compassion and true open-door policy. Every executive in Hollywood says, my door is open, you can always come to me. And they don't mean that. They don't. They don't really want to talk to you. They'll shove you off to their assistant or whatever. Um, but, yeah, the way he's really been a leader for the franchise and, you know has just written so many episodes of television. I mean, Alias, the, it goes back and back. So I'm just like, this is, this is true mentorship, where I feel like we're, we're, we're kind of like both trading and, and learning from each other. That's great. awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi, Tony. Um, I first want to say thank you again for everything. And yeah. um, one thing for me, I'm a, in the medical field, and it's very refreshing to hear you um, focus on all of that self-care instead of trying to kill yourself for your craft. I feel like yeah. that's something we don't hear enough. Yeah, you can't about. do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, which I think is a very interesting contrast for Meritor as her kind of stress relief is just very visceral and physical. Yeah. Um, my question for you, um, in all of her kind of crazy conquest and everything, um, do you feel like there's some sort of adventure where, like, you would love her to see, like, do something, like, even crazier than she's already done? Ooh. <laughs> even crazier than she's already done. Mm -hmm. There's crazy stuff coming up in season five. Man, I don't know. You know, because she's a cartoon, sometimes I'm, like, jealous of the stuff she gets to do. <laughs> I'm like, I want to, but I want to film it and do that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, when I worked on Space Force, I got to uh, experience, like, wires, like, rigging for the first time. And I loved it so much. There was this whole day where we just played and, like, jumped and, the, you know, because mm -hmm. you have to, like, get in sync with the, the rigger mm -hmm. that's pulling it. for you. Yes. Um, so you kind of have to, like, give them cues. So it becomes this little synchronized dance together. Um, so this is not answering your question. I guess I'm more just like, just let me play more live action Mariner and do more stuff with her myself. <laughs> Sweet. And a follow up question for that. So in the live action crossover, was there any other ad lib things where you're like, man, I should have like had this punch in there or something like that? I have no regrets. I left it absolutely all out on the field. I gave them <laughs> so many takes. I gave them too many takes. Uh, <laughs> I, there are about 40 takes of me objectifying Ethan Peck that <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've told this story before but I, you know, I asked his permission beforehand because it, in improv it's like a, it's a delicate line of like you don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable but you do want people to be surprised like you know but so whenever it's about like talking about someone's physical appearance you always want to check and uh so I pulled him aside before and I was like, hey, you know, this part is written in the script, but I'm going to riff a couple lines. Are you cool if I just like talk about in general, like what a beautiful person you are? And he's like, yeah, go nuts. Like, go, do it. And I was like, OK, I'm just going to kind of like objectify you. And he was like, yes. And he goes, thank you for asking. I was like, of course. So then as we're doing it, we just did like take after take after take. And Kat Lynn, one of the writers for the episode, when we were done, I went, yeah, sorry. I just had to like lightly objectify Spock. And Kat walks by and she goes, that wasn't light. <laughs> I was like, okay, I've been called out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, you were speaking earlier about your um, casting room, or your when you were going in to be cast for this position. Mm -hmm. Out of everyone in that room, or across the United States and Canada, who would you want to bring on as a guest star onto um, either the Academy or Lower Decks to Ooh. really go bonkers with? Oh. And is there also anyone in this entire Star Trek pantheon you would love to work with in whether the original character or in some other character? Yeah. Hmm. I think, um, okay, well, there is someone that I want to say, but they are coming up in season five, and so I can't tell you about it. <laughs> but I'm very excited for season five. Um, I, have, uh, I have a couple really good friends that I think would be so fun to have in Trek. Um, I, I was just talking about Kevin Hart. I think Kevin would be so fun in Star Trek. He is so funny and weird and like, I, I don't know. I just think that would be such a fun flavor to have mm -hmm. in Trek somewhere. Just have him be somebody's number one who's just yeah. kind of like, I don't know, two on top of stuff, but also freaking out. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> 
And who would I want to work with? I mean, obviously, Avery Brooks. Uh, maybe, you know, Terry Farrell and I haven't gotten to know each other as much at the cons. We've also kind of, like, mm -hmm. missed each other. But when I have met her, it's been so warm and great. I think it'd be cool to see, like, Mariner and, and Jed Zia do some stuff together. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Yeah, you can grab it if that's easier. Hi. Hi. So, I have a question. Who is your favorite character in Lower Decks? In Lower Decks? Me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was I supposed to be like a, a, a bigger person and say somebody else? True. Uh, <laughs> like, what would your favorite character be other than the Mariner? Oh, okay. Well, um, I guess I, I, you know, I, I love Boimler so much. I think he's really grown so much. You know, it's... My, uh, Mike talks about how they conceived of the, the characters and he really like, you know, he wrote Mariner this really specific way and then he needed to come up with what in writing you call a foil. You need somebody that's gonna be kind of an opposite and bring out the best and worst qualities of your main character. And so for Boimler to start as a foil and really become, I consider us like co-leads, like truly like we're, we're the Daffy duo. I think that's just, that's beautiful. Because he could have stayed kind of one note, but that would have gotten boring, you know? And that's a testament to Jack, too. Jack really made him, made him something special. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello. How hello. are you on this fine day? Oh, I'm great on this fine right. day. How are you? I'm awesome. Wondrous. Cool. Okay. My question is, what was your favorite episode to, like, record and do the audio for and stuff? Ooh, I really love the first Crisis Point, season one, episode eight, because of the because of the Vindicta stuff. I loved, I loved doing my. I that was my take on like Intendant Kira. Wow. You know, it was just a true like oh, because Mike wrote it and he was kind of like, I, we don't know if this is gonna work or not. It might seem too cheesy, but just try like a voice, try like an arch like villainous voice. And I was like, oh, I know exactly what this is. This is Mirror Universe Kira. <laughs> Just like, uh, just so campy and ridiculous. You watch some of those Mirror Universe episodes and the, the acting they're doing is like, it's like they're in 1930s Dracula. I'm like, what? <laughs> I wanna grab Nana Visitor and be like, what were you smoking that day? <laughs> but I, I love it, I love the Mirror Universe. It's so campy. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Hello. Hi, hi, Tawny. Thank hi. you for being here. Um, you've talked a couple of times about you and Jack improvising on Strange New World. How much did the Strange New Worlds cast improvise back at you? Oh my gosh! So they, it varied. Some of them were terrified. Um, some of them are so fun. Like Rebecca Romaine is so funny naturally. I mean, she's married to Jerry O'Connell. Like you have to be. Um, so she was so funny, that hallway scene we did together, there's like 50 different takes of us just saying different stuff as she's like, you know, I don't wanna know, I don't, don't tell me, just blah, blah, you know, as she's like backing down the hall. Um, so she did quite a lot, and she's been friends with Jonathan a long time, so I think she felt really comfortable. But like, it was funny, like Celia, Melissa Navia, Chrissy, uh, who plays La'an, they were all like, oh, we don't, we don't do this. We're drama actors. We don't improvise. <laughs> but then you get them off the clock at a bar or something, and they're like so funny. Sally is one of the funniest people I know. And so I'm like, just put that in the acting. Just do that, but when the cameras are on you. And it's just funny. I think how some people are taught acting. Like I went to a very serious acting school. You're taught that it's like this very serious thing where you have to think of your backstory and your motivation and subtext and blah, blah. And sometimes I'm like, no, just be, just be this, whatever you are, just do that when they're rolling, <laughs> you know? But I, I just don't think it, it feels as comfortable to some people. So we were definitely trying to like pull it out of them, but yeah. Follow up, mm -hmm. there's one line from that episode that struck out, that stuck out at me as, as something that Rebecca absolutely improvised, which was, is it me or are all, all these references very specific? Uh, <laughs> no, she did not improvise that, oh. but. You know why it felt that way? Because one, she's very funny and natural, but two, uh, I think that line was specifically written by Kat Lynn, because there are co-writers on every episode, so it's Bill Walkoff, Kat Lynn. Kat Lynn used to write for Lower Decks, so okay. she, and she still does consulting for Lower Decks, so I, I think that some of the lines that really sound kind of Lower Decks-y or Im improv-y, a lot of them came from her. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I think that came from her. If I'm lying, someone tell me. Is this being recorded? Am I going to get yelled at? <laughs> hello, fellow Californian. Oh, hello. Yes. How are you? Except I'm from the other end of the States. Oh, that's okay. I know. <laughs> um, 
number one, looking forward to the cruise and just yeah. saying it, but Mariner of the Seas. Mm-hmm. Number two. It's my ship. I have to drive it. I'm terrified. Exactly. <laughs> number two, crisis point three, the search for Shempo. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm going to pitch it. Yeah. <laughs> And just speaking to the podcast, mentioned Pod Directive, and yeah. I know there was a new episode of a certain other podcast. I'm wondering if Sweet. Yo, This Is Racist is going to start picking up again. Uh, we've been going. You have been. Yeah. And I need to catch up. Yeah. What happened to your phone? <laughs> Maybe a- it stopped update. downloading. No, we've... That's we, my fault. We've been recording because that was one of those podcasts that wasn't uh, covered under the strike. That's just ours. We own it. It's on our own network. It's totally independent. So... That we've we've been doing all okay, year. Now there's something wrong with my phone because the last one I have was three days ago. Oh no! You got to get to the Apple Store. <laughs> Is this what you no, came here for? No, then I'll buy things and <laughs> you know that, you know thing. But yeah, I'll catch up. But looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Hey, you look great. Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, oh, so if you could give any advice to people who would start want to start voice acting or just acting. Mm. Like, yeah. What would you say? Um, okay. I don't know about voice acting, because voice acting, it was weird, right? I just went to this audition, and now I do this job, but <laughs> I wasn't, like, trying to be a voice actor, and I don't really do a lot of it outside of this job, because I don't like it very much. I like Mariner. I don't, I don't love voice acting. Um, advice to be an actor. Yeah, you got to really want it, because it's going to hurt your feelings a lot. So you got to, like, make yourself kind of not, like, too tough where you can't still be soft, but, like, you got to make yourself pretty tough. And then if it's beating you up more than some other easier job would be, like, if you're over there looking at your friends who work in a factory and you're like, man, if only, that's the time to get out. Don't let it beat you up. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank was that too dark? No. Nah. Okay. <laughs> it's true. This business is hard, but, yeah. you know, it can be, there are bright spots. There are yeah. bright spots. Good luck. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, as a, you know, as a main cast member who's also a pre-existing Star Trek fan, what have you been able to do in Lower Decks that you, as a fan, feel is, like, new and interesting for Star Trek? Um, say the F word. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a lot of swearing in Lower Decks, um, which, by the way, you know, we bleep because it's funnier, not because mm-hmm. we're censored to. Mm-hmm. No one at the studio, no, no one's ever told us to censor it, but beeps are just funnier. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, look at Dr. Ta'ana. Um, I know, what an iconic character. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, there is some part of me that's like, all of Star Trek is very... Some people view Star Trek as very chaste and very like high-minded and Shakespeare and blah blah blah. But I think those of us who are real deal fans who rewatch episodes all the time know how like creepy and weird and like hypersexualized and just deeply effed up it is. And so I, I've enjoyed that Lower Decks has been able to really bring that out and be like, no, no, the the, the some of the best parts of this franchise are the weirdest, creepiest. <laughs> Like, not so chaste, not so, you know, like, perfect uh, elements of it. Because I think it all needs to be celebrated. It's the weirdest franchise in the world. Like, yeah. Marvel, Star Wars, they're, they're all great, but they cannot touch us in terms of weirdness. <laughs> and I'm just like, more and more. They can. Thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, Joe Piscopo? <laughs> Rumple Stiltskin, Iggy Pop. These are Iggy Pop gives the most unhinged guest performance in in all of Trek. I will I will put mo- money on that. If you haven't seen that episode where he's a Vorta in a long time, go watch it. It's the strangest performance. Anyway, so I I want to piggyback on what that conversation was. I did not want to like Lower Decks because it was the first cartoon and it was strange. Sure. Right? And I fell in love with it mainly because of your character and because of the way that you and um, Boyne would interact. You're now part of like the religion of Star Trek, right? <laughs> yes, you're, praise you're, be. <laughs> you're, you're in the you're you're in the cult, so yeah, welcome. Yeah, yeah. But how does it fe- does it feel? So two questions. Does it feel? How does it feel going from? Forgive me. I didn't know you until you were on Lower Decks, and then I had to like 
check your IMDb so that I could sound like I knew you, but I didn't. Uh-huh. <laughs> but you're part of this world now. Yeah. What does it feel like having this particular universe of people fawning over you? And what is the biggest difference, do you think, between the, the, the tracks, all the tracks before you that were live action and everyone had to be in the same room? I assume a lot of your work, you're like, you don't have to be with the other actors. No. But that takes away from being able to read them. Mm-hmm. What, can you talk about what the differences are between like what you feel the differences are? Yeah, so uh, it is really isolated. We all record separately, which is hard, but it also like we get to see each other so much at like press things, conventions, yeah. stuff like this that it, we, you know we've really created like a family. Jack and I talk all the time about how it's so rare to make a close friend on an animated show because it's just you just don't have that like onset time bonding. Yeah. And, you know, he's one of my best friends. It's, it's just because we voice two cartoon characters, which is so wild. Yeah. Um, and then, wait, what was your other question? How does it feel like being basically part of the echelon of stars of a Star Trek series? Because you're, you're, you're now like one of many stars in our little cult that we love. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I love it. You know, it's, it's interesting because I came from like stage and, and theater in Second City. And so you're on stage at Second City and it's like whether people know your name or not, all these people are there to like watch you tell some jokes that you wrote that you thought were funny and they either laugh or they don't and then at the end of the thing they clap and so you just feel like you got like a little recognition like you go okay I did that 300 people watched it I accomplished what I needed to do eight shows a week right and then when you go to TV you do your thing it goes into the little camera and then it goes out into the void and then like nobody says anything to you ever again and then one day you get a very nice paycheck and you're like wow I'm so lucky to do this but then you just kind of sit in your house and you're like did I do a thing? So this community and like coming to conventions and all of that, it, it feels like, oh, people watch the thing that we made. Like you, you just don't get that in other TV. So I'm just forever grateful to just have like people come up to me and be like, we watch your show. And I'm like, it exists. This isn't just something happening in my mind. I haven't accidentally inner lighted myself and I'm just like <laughs> living a probe life, you know? <laughs> I'll, I'll just say one last thing. Being from yeah. California, please do a USS Lake Elsinore. Thank you. Lake Elsinore. Oh, my God. For all the poppies. <laughs> Hello. Hi there. Thank Hi. you for being here today. Thank I have you. two questions, both actually related to Space Force. Okay. And the first was, how much of that was improvised? Because you were working with, that, that was a hell of a cast. Yeah. And where would you have liked to have seen it go? Because it felt like the show kind of abruptly oh, ended yeah. and they didn't get to do more. Where were you hoping it was going? And And... Oh those my are gosh. my questions. Thank, thank you for those questions. Yeah, they pulled the plug on us fast. Um, <laughs> so the thing about Space Force, I heard, uh, I don't know if this is factually true, but it was swirling around a lot at the time. Our first season was the most expensive half-hour comedy ever made. Mm. <laughs> and, then, uh, <laughs> and then it did big numbers. Like, a lot of people watched it, but then I don't think a lot of people loved it. <laughs> so then Netflix was like, all right, we're giving you a second season, but you have to move it to Canada. We're slashing the number of episodes. Nobody's getting their pay increases. Like, they were like, you have no money. There's no guest stars. So then it became like an office comedy, right? Yeah. And so what's interesting is season one was huge and beautiful. We had these really cool, fancy directors. Um, Paul King directed our pilot. And there were like, you know, tanks and 200 extras running around the background, CG rockets. So... You can imagine something like that, you know, it felt like a Michael Bay movie. There's not a ton of time for you to be standing there, for me and Ben Schwartz to be like riffing and be like, what's funnier for me to say, bologna sandwich or ham or whatever? Like, there's not time. There's tanks coming, there's all these shots, there's a crane shot, you know? So we finished season one and Steve Carell uh, looked at Greg Daniels and he said, well, that was beautiful, we did a really good job, but it wasn't very fun. And Greg was like, no. And Steve's like, no, like, I want to have fun. I don't want beauty to overtake the, like, comedy and looseness of it. So then when Netflix slashed our budget, season two, I think everyone was like, well, we can't afford anything big and grand anyway, so let's just make this an office comedy. Let's make it a workplace comedy about being in the military. And so season two was a blast, and there was way more improv, it was way looser, so if you were one of those people, I don't blame you, who watched season one, gave up on it, and didn't watch season two, I'd encourage you to watch season two because I think it's more in the spirit of what we all wanted to make. Great. Thank you. And, yeah. and it was a great show, so thank you. Thanks. I had fun. <laughs> I made some friends, you know. 
Hi, Ms. Newsom. Uh, my questions are also about Space Force. Uh, one is, what is General Ned's wife really imprisoned for? We never, get, we, we never found out. I don't know. <laughs> None of us know. I wonder if Greg Daniels knows. Okay. I honestly don't know. They just never told us, and we just kind of stopped asking. We were like, are we supposed to know? I don't think Lisa Kudrow knows. I don't know. This is like the, this is the You're So Vain song of Space Force. <laughs> also, uh, my second question about Space Force is when they see the, uh, the comet about to hit Earth, they start singing Kokomo by the Beach Boys. Yeah. What would you be singing if you were in a similar situation, or Mariner for that matter? Would you have a song that you're going to sing when you know that doom is on its way? I guess I would be singing a song like to whatever aliens were trying to kill us. Like, please don't do this. <laughs> like save us you know I guess yeah it wouldn't work but I'd try okay thank you <laughs> thanks anybody else hi so I have more questions um yeah so I can't remember if it was on yo is this racist or your Star Trek podcast but I know that you talked about Chandra Prescott Weinstein's book The Disordered Cosmos mm -hmm. and thank you because I'm a librarian and I've book talked it since then oh, and cool. I really appreciate it I was wondering if you have any other book recommendations and Ooh. if not other media recommendations are fine I ha I go through fits and spurts with reading this past year, I have not read a lot because I've been reading so many scripts. It kind of like takes up the part of my brain that can handle any more fiction or anything. Um, so yeah, I don't really have a good book recommendation. I read like a terrible like <laughs> romance book because I was in an airport stuck somewhere and my, and my computer died. So I was like, oh, this is, romance has come a long way. I was like reading it like a scholar or something. I was like, interesting. Um, <laughs> media recommendations what have I even been watching you know what's so weird I love the morning show it is such a bonkers if you can't tell I love things that are weird <laughs> and the morning show I would not say is a good show I would say it is one of the weirdest shows and it has all these shiny beautiful rich people that all just have like perfect blowouts and look so fancy and famous and then say the most unhinged lines you've ever heard, but they say it with a straight face. They say like, I'm married to the news. And you're like, <laughs> what? And I started watching it because I was working with Steve Carell at the time, and so when the uh, first season of it came out, we were all like, oh, we really like the show. And he was even like, you do? <laughs> I don't know, there's something very soothing about it. It's so insane, but I don't know, I like it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm afraid this will be our last question. Oh. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, um, kind of seeing your work in Star Trek and, you know, knowing about you kind of, you know, it seems like you believe in Star Trek, um, you know, seeing that happen is inspiring. And I wanted to ask you, I guess, um, in that way that like where, you know, you acted in a role and then now you're getting involved in like writing and producing, um, you're kind of like, uh, you're kind of getting to the same level as like Leonard Nimoy or Jonathan oh Frakes. Well, I mean, in terms Thank of you. That's in terms amazing. of you know, you're you're affecting like multiple parts of the series, and that you seem to believe it and live it to some degree. Um, can you speak to that, or or have you thought about that? Um, thank you. That what a lovely question. I I don't know that I've quite reached uh, those legends heights, but uh, I'll 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 take it as like an aspirational thing. Like I I'll get there. Um, you know, one of the writers in our room, Kirsten Bears, she also writes Picard, Discovery, all, all, all the shows, Strange. Um, she said something about how she just thinks of the universe as a, re as a real place. And so then it just, it, it's a no-brainer, like, how important the Federation needs to be to her, how, you know, important, like, details are, like if you just think of it as real history and like a, a really real universe, then you can feel like personally invested in it. You can advocate for things at, at, just as you would in your real life on earth. And I really took that to heart. I was like, oh yeah, I guess that is what I'm doing because I've been a fan for so long. I think of it as real. And so I, I'm grateful that I get to contribute to all these different shows in different ways. And a lot of it is because, you know, I had I had Jonathan Frakes call me from the set of Strange New Worlds two weeks ago to ask me a canon question. 
and he was like, this can't do blah, 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 right? These aliens, they can't do blah, 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 because the writers wrote this, and I don't think that's canonically right. They can't do that, right? And I went, no, jo Jonathan, they actually can, and here's an example of it. And he was like, see, this is why I call Tawny. <laughs> I was like, okay, Thank that's you. wild, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And Thanks. now the uh, uh, not the talk is uh, coming to a close. Um, the we're going to have an, a bit of an auction. The Ooh. Wonder Twins have donated some items for uh, Tony to auction off, and uh, she'll personalize them for the winner. Uh, the uh, Wonder Twins donate these for to benefit the Julian Fleming Memorial Fund, uh, which is a charity that Farpoint works closely with. It uh, donates uh, money to families with terminally ill children. Uh, so, uh, in order to help raise money for them, they have donated <laughs> the Great Koala of the Galaxy. It comes with a tag to, for, that can be personalized, Tony. Um, but why, why is it smiling? Is it? It's not, but we'll Almost imagine it is. Almost certainly because of the bottle of Romulan whiskey that comes with it. <laughs> I don't know if you should drink this. <laughs> Uh, we even have a picture of uh, Ensign's Mariners uh, holding the bottle to show providence. <laughs> uh, can we get an opening bid for both of these items? Yeah. We start at... Who wants a koala and something that might poison you? $50. How much would you say, sir? One hundred dollars. That is a great start. One twenty-five over there. That's fantastic. One twenty-five. One fifty. You'll take it back. Both of them. Tawny will personalize it. Right now. One fifty. That's fan. Two hundred dollars over there. Ooh. Thank you. Two hundred dollars. Deadpool Boimler. <laughs> Two hundred dollars. Two fifty. You'll take it back. $200 for charity, that's great, but we can do more. I almost took that. <laughs> Careful waving right now, we're in the middle of an auction. Right now, these uh, fantastic items are going for $200. Anybody? Yeah. Anyone to drink this, pass away, and then see this? <laughs> no? That's why it's a package deal. Mm-hmm. $200 going once. Absolutely, we take credit card. $250. Wow, Thank right. you very much. $250. $300 will take it back. And now it's going for $250. That's great. Um, and uh, this is actual whiskey. It is, you know. Two seventy-five. That's fantastic. Two seventy-five. Heard. Uh, definitely says Romulan Blue Ale. Wow. Yeah. Star Trek Spirits .com. This is officially licensed. It's officially bad for you because it's whiskey. Is Star Trek Spirits .com? Can you just get other Star Trek booze? Uh, really? Yeah. Can you get uh, like Canar and like? Yeah. Yeah. And blood wine? I gotta get online. <laughs> Okay, but what about that um, disappearing one that Guinan makes, the Tsartak thing, no? That's a mixed drink. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Make that at home. All right, we've got 275 going once. 275, do I hear 300? 275 going twice. And these fantastic items have been sold for $275 to benefit our charities. Thank you very much. Uh, if you'd come backstage at the end of the talk, we'll uh, get you set up. Cool. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, 
And yeah, that is the, um, all the time we have. So if everyone give another round of applause of thanks to Tawny Newsom for coming you. to Farpoint. Be sure to stop by her table. Be sure to come back to her talk tomorrow yeah. to come up with some more questions. And you all have a great Farpoint. Yeah, thank you for all your questions. They're really lovely. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Hi, this is Bonnie Gordon, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Make sure to like and subscribe before the self-destructs in five, four, three, two, one. Just kidding. Have fun and follow your fandom.